Jesus or Christ. Here in Norway I naturally feel that I am a guest, and I must above all express my heartfelt thanks, both to the speaker who has just addressed to me such warm words, and to all of you who have shown your interest by coming to hear what I have to say in the short space of time at my disposal concerning the problem indicated in our subject. I should like to say in advance, my dear friends, that I feel myself in a double sense a guest within the theological movement for the reason that in the anthroposophical movement I have always em emphasized the fact that anthroposophy does not in any way wish to be some sort of a new religious institution or even a new sect, but that its aim is to grow out of the modern scientific movement in general. Anthroposophy strives to find the suitable methods of investigation for the supersensible facts of human life and of universal existence. And only in so far as the sphere of theology forms part of the general sphere of investigation does anthroposophy feel inclined, if asked, to contribute to theological investigation what it believes to be able to give in this direction with the aid of methods belonging to a supersensible investigation. It was for this reason that when a large number of young theologians approached me in Germany, I said that I was willing to help them only with what I could offer from an anthroposophical standpoint, for whatever is needed today within the theological religious movement itself must be undertaken by persons who stand within this theological or religious life. The chief objection raised against anthroposophy from this direction is that it strives, with the aid of its methods of investigation, to rise through the acquirement of knowledge into supersensible worlds, that it strives to develop certain latent cognitive faculties in man in order to penetrate into supersensible worlds and investigate them. The objection is raised in these same theological circles that this is really in contradiction to the religious spirit, to religious piety, and that this is the very thing, therefore, which must be rejected by Christian theology. And this has recently been expressed especially clearly by saying that religion must work with the irrational, with the mystery that must not be unveiled through rationalism. Religion should work with an element that does not wish to be understood, but should rather be venerated with the deepest and most trustful reverence as an impenetrable mystery. It has even been stated that Christianity makes use of paradox in order to draw out and to form the truly Christian religious life with sufficient depth, out of direct human trustfulness. If anthroposophy were to strive to rationalize the irrational, especially in connection with the problem of Christ Jesus, and to draw down into the regions of cold understanding what is contained in the mystery of Golgotha, the objections raised from this direction would in that case be justified. Moreover, these objections are supplemented by still another one. Since anthroposophy is not Gnosticism, nor mysticism, nor an non-historical Orientalism, it takes into account absolutely the historical development in human evolution. Gnosticism is non-historical. Mysticism is non-historical. All Oriental world conceptions are, in a certain sense, non-historical. Anthroposophy is a Western world conception through and through, particularly as regards its historical standpoint, and it considers historical evolution as something real, just as one is accustomed to do in the scientific life of the West. Anthroposophy feels compelled, therefore, to place the personality of Jesus within the historical life of humanity. It knows what this historical Jesus bore within himself for humanity. Only it is compelled for reasons which I wish to explain today 
to ascend from the man Jesus, who can be observed in his earthly life, to the superterrestrial, extraterrestrial, cosmic being of the Christ who incarnated in the man, Jesus. So that anthroposophy can really speak in a certain sense of Christ Jesus as a twofold being. The objection may be raised at this point that what anthroposophy has to say about the cosmic or even about the telluric Christ has really no importance whatever for the religious life of modern humanity. Modern humanity, it will be said, wishes to limit its contemplation to earthly facts when considering historical evolution so that there is no longer any need to place the cosmic Christ beside the historical Jesus. Now, my dear friends, the first thing which I shall have to show you is the way in which anthroposophy must face the facts of the world and how it attains to a quite special attitude toward this mystery of Golgotha through its methods of research. Anthroposophy strives, in the first place, to grasp in a quite definite way, devoid of illusion and in quite clear outlines, what has been developed in Western humanity, especially since the middle of the 15th century, as that form of knowledge, which I may call the, quote, knowledge of physical objects, close quote, through this form of knowledge, The world of nature has already been explained, systematized, and grasped in accordance with its laws, in a truly wonderful way. Parenthesis, indeed, the ideal of science quite justifiably has even more extensive aims than this. Close parenthesis. And we have a subjective parallel phenomenon in a sound and dignified science, the fact that man becomes rationalistic, I might even say abstract, in the acquirement of knowledge. The world of thought acquires more and more this character of mere pictures. If we go back beyond the 15th century, we shall find that the world of thought did not possess at that time the character of pictures or that abstract character which merely designates reality but does not contain it. That same character which the world of thought has acquired ever since the 15th century, and particularly since the time of Galileo and Giordano Bruno. Ideas, for us today, signify at the most the image of reality. If we go back beyond the 15th century, we find that man did not as yet feel that a true spiritual reality enters his being when he surrenders himself to the world of thought. At that time man possessed not only the abstract world of ideas, but a world of ideas filled with spirit, really permeated by spirit. As far as rationalism and natural science are concerned, great and wonderful results have been achieved during recent centuries. And we come to see more and more clearly how also other sciences, such as the science of history, have become affected by the mentality and the manner of thinking which rules in those fields. One who follows the change that has taken place in the methods of investigation during recent centuries, as this affects the sphere of theology, will find that the mentality in these investigations was influenced throughout by the natural scientific direction of thought, for history has, in fact, in modern times, assumed the characteristic of a natural scientific mentality. Thus, Christology has gradually become an historical, quote, investigation of the life of Jesus, close quote. This is quite comprehensible when we look upon the whole course of spiritual evolution in modern times. We must understand that this has to be so. But we must also understand that this direction, if followed further, will tend at the same time to rob Christianity of the Christ and will approach more and more closely to what can be offered by the neutral attitude toward religion of an historian like Ranka, for instance, who placed the personality of Jesus within the historical course of events as the noblest being who ever walked upon earth. 
Theology has thus approached even nearer to historical investigation. Until today we find that many theologians can hardly be distinguished in their mentality and methods of investigation from an historian as eminent as Ranka. In contrast to this, anthroposophy emphasizes that certain cognitive forces which remain latent in man during ordinary life and are also latent in ordinary science, forces of which we are not conscious but which are nevertheless contained in every man and can be drawn up out of his consciousness, lead man through knowledge out of the mere sense world and enable him to grasp by its means a supersensible world in the same way that a human being endowed with senses is able to grasp the sense world. An attitude and a method such as this, which is no longer connected with mere physical objects, and which possesses nothing of the ordinary form of rationalism, but rather comes ever nearer to knowing true experience, enables man, through his own efforts, to approach the supersensible world. Now, it is an error which one frequently encounters to believe that anthroposophy seeks to transfer to a supersensible sphere the characteristics belonging to knowledge gained in the sphere of science or rationalism, that anthroposophy accordingly is itself a rational thing and therefore obliterates mystery and everything which is irrational or paradox and requires a logical acceptance of what it looks upon as the mystery of Golgotha. At the same time, not an acceptance based upon confidence and reverence that is freely given, as is required by religion. Yet the whole picture of the world and of man himself changes completely when we ascend beyond the scientific or historical sphere of knowledge and arrive at the knowledge of the supersensible sphere, if I may use this expression. I can merely allude to such things on this occasion, but if we wish to trace the most characteristic aspect of the ordinary scientific method, limited to physical objects and recognized at the present time, it is this, that for one who really and honestly draws the last possible conclusion from natural science and rationalism, it divides the world into two spheres. These two spheres will not always be noticed, because there is present in man a certain inner and unconscious fear of drawing these ultimate conclusions. Nevertheless, anyone who has learned to know, as I have done, human beings who have suffered deeply because of this twofold division in human nature, and who have drawn with all the fervor of their hearts and their religious feeling the very last conclusions possible in modern thought. Anyone who has seen the great suffering of souls, the groping without direction, which may be found attaching itself, just in connection with the deepest religious feeling, to this dualism in modern rationalistic science and to its attitude toward man, will feel inclined to reflect and to consider how it was that dualism gave rise to a cognitive attitude also in the religious sphere. For natural science does indeed exert too great a power upon the human mind. In the face of its conceptions, man's responsibility is so great that he must strive to shape other scientific methods according to the model of the natural, scientific, historical, realistic method. But where does this method lead to, if it is to draw the ultimate conclusions? It leads to where a deep abyss, an abyss which cannot be bridged by a knowledge limited to physical objects, arises between what we acknowledge as natural scientific necessity and what we grasp within our moral ethical life, what ultimately guarantees our true human dignity. And if we truly experience this moral ethical life, it will appear to us as the direct outflow of the divine, leading us unswervingly toward religious piety, toward religiosity. 
At the same time, this deep abyss between ethical religious life and what natural science reveals, as far as physical man is concerned, may indeed be concealed from man's view by a veil of mist, owing to a certain inner unconscious sphere. Yet anyone who tries with absolute honesty to understand human nature will find that this contrast cannot be bridged with the aid of natural science. An hypothesis fully justified from a scientific standpoint, the Kant-Laplace theory, is applied to the beginning and to the end of earthly existence. I will refrain from speaking about this in detail, for although this theory has now been modified, it stands there nevertheless as something at the beginning of the world which is quite indifferent to human evolution as the source of those ethical divine ideals to which we surrender ourselves, as to something the existence of which cannot be questioned, yet something which exists merely in the form of images or pictures. Again, if we also contemplate the end of earthly existence from a natural scientific aspect, we find another hypothesis, likewise justified from a scientific aspect, namely the entropy theory, which speaks of death through heat at the end of our earthly existence. Thus a natural scientific necessity places man between the Kant-Laplace nebula and death through heat. Man lives between these two extremes and surrenders himself to his ethical religious ideals. Nevertheless, ultimately, he finds these unmasked as mere illusions, since at the end of earthly existence there faces him death through heat and the immense corpse will swallow up not only the physical etheric elements contained in earth evolution, but also everything contained in ethical ideals. My dear friends, it is most certainly not out of a religious rationalism, but out of a knowledge which I have gained in an elemental cognitive way that I am compelled to include in what is hidden by a veil of mist by which we try to conceal what approaches man, and which can be one of the most painful of all soul experiences, the fact that man has sought for information that did not exist in ancient religions, nor in the early times of Christian evolution. He has tried, namely, to distinguish between knowledge and faith. For knowledge, in spite of everything, gradually becomes a moloch, owing to the power which it necessarily exercises over the human mind. And this Moloch gradually devours faith, if faith cannot cling to a higher, truly supersensible knowledge, which is able to approach even the mystery of Golgotha. Readers aside, Moloch is M-O-L-O-C-H, end of readers aside. And here it is that anthroposophy must draw attention to the fact that what is supplied by a rigid, natural scientific necessity will assume for supersensible knowledge merely the form of a phenomenon. Just as the world which we see with our eyes and hear with our ears dissolves into phenomenalism. I can merely allude to these things today, but anthroposophy tries to show that what we see with our eyes has nothing to do with the material world, but with the world of phenomena and in supersensible knowledge, the sense world loses something of its rigid solidity, as it were, while on the other hand the ethical religious world loses likewise some of its abstractedness, some of its estrangement from physical necessity. The two worlds draw nearer to each other. The ethical religious world becomes more real, and the physical sense world assumes more of the nature of phenomena. And it is not through speculation, not through an abstract philosophical method, but through real experience, that a world is built up which transcends our ordinary sense world. Moreover, this world which we then see no longer contains any contrast between what is ideal and what is real. Both have drawn nearer together. The laws of nature become moral, I might say, in this other world, 
and the moral laws are condensed into events of nature. Let me mention only this one fact. Anthroposophy also, to be sure, places something resembling death through heat at the end of earthly existence. But anthroposophy considers that what man bears within him as moral religious ideals is like a seed for a future existence. Just as the life of this year's plants passes on through seeds into the plant life of next year. Anthroposophy here collides strongly with a certain paradox contained in modern science. After all, I do not hesitate to say this here, because I believe that it will meet with less objection in a circle of theologians than in a circle of rigid natural scientists. I shall venture to say, namely, that anthroposophical spiritual knowledge knows that the so-called law of the conservation of energy and of matter is no longer valid in a world which is described as a supersensible world. And it also knows that this law of the conservation of energy and of matter has a merely relative validity in the world which appears as the world nature and is comprehended by rationalism. Anthroposophy teaches us to realize in the case of the human organism that it is not matter alone which is to be found transforming itself there, that it is not only metamorphosis of matter that takes place. Outside the human organism, in the rest of the world of nature, the laws of the conservation of energy and of matter hold good. Within the human being himself, however, anthroposophy teaches us that there is a complete disappearance and overcoming of matter, and that a resurrection of new matter takes place arising out of mere space. If I were to use a trivial comparison in order to point out the situation with regard to matter and energy in the human organism, I should express myself as follows. In our study of the law of the conservation of energy and of matter, we miss the road in the same way that someone else might do who said that he had counted exactly how many bank notes had been deposited in the bank during a certain period of time and how many had been taken out again, and that he had found that exactly the same number had been deposited as had been taken out. We see that just as much energy passes into matter as is given out again. Nevertheless, in the same way, that we may not draw the conclusion that things in the bank remain unchanged, but must admit that independent work has to be carried on there, indeed that the bank notes may even be reprinted and then given out again in a completely new form. So in the case of the human organism, we may not draw such conclusions as are formed in connection with the law of conservation of matter and of energy. Both the destruction of matter and energy and the creation of matter and energy take place. This is not the product of some irresponsible fantasy. On the contrary, it is something which finds absolute recognition within the sphere of exact anthroposophical investigation. As far as the outer world is concerned, it is true that the law of the conservation of matter and energy holds good, that is to say, for the middle stage of evolution. When we approach the end of the earth, however, and we accept with a certain justification the theory of consumption of the earth by fire, we do not see an enormous graveyard, but we find that everything which has been developed by man in the way of moral and aesthetic ideals and godlike spiritual convictions can indeed unite itself within man with the new forms of matter that will have arisen, and that in consequence of this we have to do with an actual seed of continuing development. Through that which arises in man, the death of external matter will be overcome. We find in anthroposophical spiritual science something which does indeed show us that ethical and moral forces also are directly active within matter. In the case of man, this remains for ordinary consciousness at the present time in the unconscious. But, to repeat, 
for that stage of consciousness which is reached in anthroposophical investigation, we must recognize absolutely that what is ethical, moral, and religious is condensed to reality, and that whatever lies in the external world of matter dissolves into a mere sequence of phenomena. Thus the two worlds come nearer toward each other. Moreover, we shall also then find them coming nearer together when we see just how things look to the human being who lives in this higher knowledge. We are accustomed to speak and to judge logically when we apply ordinary rationalism to the outer world of nature and base our standpoint upon logical categories of this sort, which are quite justifiable for the outer sense world. Anthroposophical spiritual science deviates also from this method simply out of objective necessity. It must deviate from it, because with its methods of knowledge it not only experiences but also observes things differently. There are two concepts, in particular, which manifest themselves. Parenthesis, there are many others besides these, to be sure, which also manifest themselves, but these two must be considered especially important for us today. Close parenthesis. There are two concepts which we otherwise know only indirectly as objects, but which we do not ordinarily apply in the way in which we apply logical concepts. For in the world of true knowledge, even that which becomes expression, becomes revelation, is brought nearer to reality, which otherwise remains formal, ideal. The two concepts which here appear to us are the concepts of illness and health. You will all admit, my dear friends, that from the standpoint of logical categories in the ordinary sense world, it is quite impossible to speak of healthy and ill, to speak of what is not only true but what is acknowledged because it is healthy. In the world of organic nature, we recognize whatever is healthy as the principle of growth and development. We recognize what is ill as deformity, as an impediment to normal development. When we employ logical categories, however, we do not speak of healthy and ill. When we progress from the ordinary knowledge of external objects to that knowledge which is applied by anthroposophical spiritual science, we must begin to speak in terms of healthy and ill. For our observation compels us to find, in the supersensible world into which we now enter, not any longer ideas and concepts, but experiences. Healthy and ill are experiences. What we designate in the sense world with the mere abstraction true, in quotes, must be replaced by, in quotes, healthy in the supersensible world. And what we designate in the sense world as, in quotes, untrue, in quotes, wrong, must be replaced by ill, in, in quotes, when experienced in the supersensible world. And here the possibility presents itself for anthroposophy not through any wish to approach it by force, but through an entirely honest and straightforward pursuit of the investigation itself, to connect the investigation of the immediate present with the Old and New Testaments. Moreover, the cleft between modern investigation and the Old and New Testaments is here actually bridged. A new path to an understanding of the mystery of Golgotha is here opened up for something presents itself here which is very paradoxical. As I have already said, I can refer to these matters only more or less in outline today. Nevertheless, what I shall thus present to you in a rough sketch is the result of investigation carried on throughout many years, investigation which did not proceed out of any religious prejudice, if I may be permitted to use these words. I myself started out with an absolutely natural scientific education, having grown up in my youth with the greatest imaginable spiritual freedom. I brought no religious feelings over with me from my youth. Through investigations, and as the ultimate consequences of my natural scientific investigations, I have been finally impelled to say what I believe I now have the right to say, from an anthroposophical point of view 
even concerning the origin of religious problems. Thus prejudices, even subjective ones, really do not come into question here. But through anthroposophical investigations, we first recognize that we have the world of nature round about us, particularly if our understanding of nature is in complete accordance with the methods and significance of natural science, through which we can really learn to know nature more accurately, parenthesis, even though, of course, this will not always be admitted, and natural science often is contaminated, as it were, by all sorts of mysticism. Close parenthesis. If we really understand nature, not only with regard to its phenomena and its laws, but also through the fact that we can form certain conceptual ideas concerning what it really is, we shall then say to ourselves, whatever takes place out there in nature continues its course also in man. Whatever takes place outside the human skin is also to be found inside the skin of the human being standing before us. We find processes of nature outside, and we find them also inside, within us. But here we come upon the paradox which reveals itself to anthroposophical investigation, namely that all ascending processes of nature in man, all those processes which strive toward fruitfulness, have only a limited period of validity and become within man tearing down destructive processes. And as a result of a manifold observation of nature and of innumerable anthroposophical studies of the human being, this forceful and overpowering thought comes to us. Nature is permitted to be nature outside the boundaries of the human skin. Inside the sheath of man's skin, however, whatever was nature becomes the very opposite of nature. If now we have risen to the height of supersensible methods of research, we see that the forces which are constructive forces in nature become destructive forces in man, and that these destructive forces in man's nature become the bearers of evil. This is the difference which anthroposophy must point out in contrast to mere idealism, that nature is permitted to remain nature, whereas man's inner life is not permitted even in the sphere of the body to remain nature. Even from the aspect of nature, whatever is active in man as a continuation of nature becomes something pathological and hence something evil. Nature outside of us is neutral toward good and evil. In us, its activity is destructive, conducive to illness and evil, even from the bodily aspect. Moreover, we are able to withstand whatever is active in us as evil, and this again can be seen through anthroposophical perception, only through the fact that during life between birth and death our contact with external nature is such as to permit our life to become only a reflection of external nature. We do not grasp with our consciousness what is organically active in the depths of our human nature as primal foundation of evil. We fill our consciousness by receiving sense perceptions from outside. We receive these exterior sense impressions, but we convey them only to a certain point. Beyond this, they may not go. For if they did so, supersensible knowledge shows us this, they would poison us as it were, we reflect them back. In consequence of this, a boundary line arises between all that constitutes the organs of consciousness in man, those organs which receive external nature, and all that constitutes the continuation of nature itself, the further development of its constructive forces in man. The conscious processes do not reach beyond this boundary line, but are instead reflected back and form our memory or power of recollection. What lives in our memory is reflected external nature, which does not penetrate into us any more deeply than a ray of light into a mirror. 
For if man were to become conscious of what lies concealed behind his inner mirror, of what lies in those depths where nature becomes evil in him, he himself would become an evil being through this activity of nature in him. On the other hand, if we limit ourselves to these reflected pictures, to memories, to the mere reflection of nature outside of us, there would be one thing to which we could not attain, namely, to a full ego consciousness, a self-contained ego consciousness. We should not be able to attain to this. What we are accustomed to sum up as self-consciousness, what lives in our consciousness as ego, can arise only out of our bodily nature. Its primal roots are grounded in the nature of man. For this reason, rationalism, for its part, is just as neutral in its attitude toward good and evil as are the laws of nature. Yet if all that constitutes human self-consciousness were to extend over the other side of man's soul life, this awakening of the ego during the present period of human evolution would bring about an irresistible inclination to evil, to that which lives in us as destructive forces of nature. At this point there now arises a significant contribution to knowledge, which leads us over into the sphere of religion. This may seem, particularly if the physical world is contemplated from a supersensible point of view. When the human being surrenders himself completely to everything that constitutes the working of nature, to the forces that permeate natural phenomena, he comes to the point where he says that atheism is not only logically incorrect, but that it is in fact an illness. It is not an illness which is ordinarily detected, but anthroposophical spiritual science, for the very reason that it substitutes, from its supersensible point of view, the concepts healthy and ill, for the simple concepts correct and incorrect, is in a position to say that in these combinations of fluids in man, which are no longer familiar to external physiology and biology, there is present something pathological when a human being declares with all the conviction of his soul that there is no God. For a man with a sound and healthy nature says, in spite of the fact that he is capable of doing evil, this evil remains in the subconsciousness, a sound and healthy human nature says, there is a God. At the same time, this consciousness that there is a God, which is the immediate expression of a genuine human healthiness, contains only that acknowledgement of God, which I might call the acknowledgement of the Father. We can do no more by submerging ourselves in nature, by experiencing nature within us, than to attain to the consciousness of the Father. Anyone, therefore, who remains rooted in modern natural science can attain only to the consciousness of the Father, and he will more or less lose the Son, the consciousness of the Christ, from out of the ranks of divine beings, even though he will not admit this. The fundamental character of Harnack's book, titled Wesen des Christentums, Essence of Christianity, is contained in its statement that the Son really has no place in the Gospels, but only the Father, for the Son is merely the one who sent out into the world the teachings of the Father by way of the Gospels. The preceding conception actually leads us gradually away from a real or true Christianity. For if we wish to preserve Christianity, we must be able to add to the distinct and separate experience of the Father which we attain to, if we really possess a sound human nature, the experience of the Son. But this experience of the Son is the very one which arises not through an experience of nature, but through the experience of something in man which transcends nature. It is an experience belonging to that sphere which has nothing in common with nature, in contrast to which nature fades away, into mere phenomenalism. 
And then there arises the possibility that the experience of the Son may be added to the experience of the Father. Just as the experience of the Father is simply the result of perfect harmonious health, so the experience of the Son is a fact which we pass through in our inner life when we begin to notice that we are rising to the full consciousness of our ego, that we must develop this ego during our life on earth, and that this ego consciousness is itself absolutely connected with nature. If we do not wish that it should become a prey to evil, then this awakening of the ego must attain, during the course of our life on earth, to where it becomes permeated with the divine spiritual content. The words, not I, but Christ in me, must become truth. It must become truth for the reason that the ego, which can remain within the Father experience, in the form in which it is first experienced, must be completely transformed and metamorphosed. Man need not become ill through what is merely the reflection of outer nature when the latter does not itself enter his consciousness, but appears merely in mirrored pictures, in reflections. But man would of necessity become ill, as regards his true human being, were he unable to find out of his own freedom that world power which is not limited to being only the primal origin of what exists as healthy forces of nature. The human being must be able to lift himself to the recognition that this process of becoming ill must inevitably take place through the birth of the ego. The rest of man's soul life might, under certain circumstances, remain healthy, but the stability of the ego would nevertheless, of necessity, cause this soul life to become ill. If the human being were not able to meet during his life in an inward, sense-free experience, that being who can be found here upon the earth, yet who is himself not of earth, who can be found only through the free act of the soul, and the finding of whom is therefore entirely different from the finding of the Father. In Western Europe little emphasis is laid upon the distinction between these two experiences, the Father experience and the Son experience. On the other hand, if in our day we turn to the East, and study, for example, such a work as the philosophy of the Russian philosopher Soloviev, we shall find, just in his case, that he actually speaks like a man of the first Christian centuries, except that he clothes what he has to say out of this attitude of mind in modern philosophical formulas. We can see clearly, from the way in which he speaks, that his experience of the Father is quite distinct from his experience of the Son. He experiences, instinctively, what we again must discover and acknowledge through spiritual investigation. Namely, that we are born out of the Father, that it is a sign of illness not to acknowledge the Father, yet at the same time that for human beings endowed with an ego, there must be a process that heals, a super-earthly healer, and this is the Christ. Not to experience the Father means to be inwardly ill. Not to experience the Christ means the entrance of sorrow and misfortune in our lives. The Father problem is a question of knowledge. The Son problem is a question of destiny, a question of blessing and misfortune. And only those epochs which have considered the Christ as a physician, as a universal healer, have been able to attain to a satisfying conception of the way in which he enters our life. For supersensible anthroposophical investigation, it is no mere phrase, not something which has a merely allegorical and symbolic meaning when we say Christ the physician, Christ the savior or healer, parenthesis heiland oder heiler, close parenthesis. He who sets the ego free from that danger from which the Father cannot free it. For whatever is healthy can also become ill. Through the ego consciousness alone, healthiness would necessarily disappear. 
What the Father is unable to do, He has conferred upon the Son. The Christ enters human consciousness through a quite distinct experience at the side of the Father. Spiritual, scientific, anthroposophical investigation can justify this experience in accordance with absolutely scientific methods. But first, at this point, something would reveal itself which I should like to call the eternally present Christ. We find Him, if we only seek deeply enough, in our soul's being. We find Him as a being whom we cannot bring forth out of our own soul. We find Him as we find an external event of nature outside of us, quite objectively. We meet Him after our birth, during the course of our human development. We must draw Him forth out of our moral perception. Yet at the same time He is the eternally present Christ. If, on the other hand, we have found this eternally present Christ, if we have justified Him in the face of anthroposophical investigation, we enter also upon historical investigation in a way quite different from the one we have previously followed. For this is the strange thing about it, that when we ascend to the higher consciousness, we must first again descend to the ordinary consciousness. We cannot investigate the sense world in a higher consciousness. This would lead only to phrases and idle words. If someone were to develop a higher consciousness only, to know only what anthroposophy is, he would have to beware of speaking about natural science, for he who wishes to speak about natural science must also have a thorough scientific knowledge of nature in accordance with the methods of modern investigation. He can at the same time permeate what natural science has to give with supersensible investigation. A layman, a dilettante, is not permitted to speak on natural science, no matter how much at home he may be in the knowledge of the supersensible worlds. The supersensible worlds have, as a matter of fact, exactly the same significance for the sense worlds, which oxygen has when it is outside the lungs. The lung is what corresponds to nature. Spiritual science must first be poured into natural science if natural science is to be made fruitful. But here another sphere may be considered. And again, I repeat, this is not because of any religious prejudice. One may approach it at first without any historical consideration, and quite without any help from the Gospels. It is what I should like to describe as that epoch of human development which coincides outwardly for us with the mystery of Golgotha. It is a fact that also one who does not advance to supersensible concepts and ideas may approach the mystery of Golgotha. In this case he will be tempted to proceed more and more in a purely external naturalistic historical way and to transform Christ Jesus into the simple personality of Jesus of Nazareth. He who progresses to anthroposophical, spiritual investigation finds everywhere the necessity, first of all, to permeate with knowledge everything that presents itself in the field of nature and of ordinary history. It is only when approaching the historical mystery of Golgotha that he does not find this necessity. For here the higher concepts may be applied directly and without preconception. It is possible to comprehend directly, through supersensible investigation, what took place in the sense world in just the way in which it took place. Here we come to the next point. We see now that the ego development, about which I have already spoken to you, was actually not always present in human development. We find justification, for example, for the fact that the farther back we go in the evolution of speech, the more we find that the designation for I, capital, the ego, is included within the verb, that the designation of the ego as a word by itself appears only later in human evolution. 
yet this is only something external. One who studies the psychology of history, while at the same time penetrating into it with supersensible perception, will find that the ego experience actually did not exist until about the 8th or the 7th century before Christ, that it then gradually began to appear, and that historical development in human history actually tended toward what we must call the dawning of the ego. I believe it was especially in the life of the Greek people that the dawn of this ego was felt so completely. This was not only because they were conscious of the fact that this ego had its origin in nature and is therefore subjected to nature, thus bringing death to man if it develops for itself alone, for this reason the Greeks really felt that it is better to be a beggar in the upper world than a king in the world of shades. This was an altogether justified feeling. But it was felt also in another way. He who really studies the great Greek dramatists, not in the superficial manner in which this is often done today, knows that they desired at the same time to be physicians that they wished to shape the course of the drama in such a way that the human being might recover his health through a catharsis. The Greeks had a sense for the need of healing in their art. And now, if we pass over in this period of historical development into the Roman world, we feel how the content of the human soul, in religious life, in the life of the state, and in public life, becomes stiffened in abstract concept. We find humanity in great danger at that time of becoming ill as a result of ego development. And we feel what it really means. Parenthesis, I am not making use of analogy nor playing with words. Even if it may appear to be so, what I am saying is really the result of anthroposophical investigation. Close parenthesis. We have a feeling for what it really means when in the Orient the therapeutists appeared a certain order which set itself the task of actually healing humanity, which was falling into illness, restoring it to health. What we see arising in the course of historical evolution is that humanity did not wither away and become ill, as we would suppose to be the case if we were to consider without preconception the continuation of those impulses alone which existed in humanity previous to the 7th and 8th centuries before Christ. Humanity does not wither away, does not become ill. On the contrary, it receives into itself a certain ingredient which has a healing influence from within. We see here the activity of an historical therapy. Anyone who does not feel that the Old Testament and also the other ancient religions point throughout to the fact that man's course of evolution is a gradual, sickening process through sin, who does not see that humanity becomes ill through sin, cannot feel, on the other hand, a certain something that radiates forth and brings to the earth from outside, from outside the telluric sphere, a new influence in the same way that a new force enters the soil when seeds are sown there. We learn to understand that a fructifying seed has been sown from supersensible worlds as a seed that brings healing, for humanity was indeed about to become ill. We learn to see, moreover, that something which is cosmic and not merely telluric enters the evolution of the earth. And when we learn to see in this way, when we see a being entering historical evolution as the great invisible therapeutist, we may then trace the personality of Jesus of Nazareth. It arises before us, even without the help or influence of the Gospels. For a search of this sort is not influenced by prejudice, but is led by a star, by something which is like the flashing forth of an inner light, which enables us to find the personality we have sought. Thus we really follow two different roads. On the one hand, we unite all sciences, including that one which takes into consideration in historical evolution not merely the concepts right and wrong, 
but also the concepts healthy and ill. We adopt this synthetic science, and with it we approach the mystery of Golgotha, just as the three wise men or magi from the East approached it of old, with their ancient science and their starry lore. On the other hand, we may also approach this mystery out of the simple feeling of the human heart, out of the true feelings of human nature. If we meet the eternally present Christ, whom we can only find if we possess that organ into which the eternally present Christ says in the spirit of St. Paul, not I, but Christ in me makes me healthy, redeems me from death, giving me life again, we shall also find the man Jesus in the history of humanity, the man Jesus in whom the Christ actually lived. In this way, the super-terrestrial being of the Christ, the healer, the great therapist, becomes united with the simple man of Nazareth, who could not be otherwise than simple and gentle and who was able to speak to the poorest of the poor, who could also address his words to sinners, that is, to the diseased, but who spoke to them words which did not only contain what had been active within humanity up to that time, for in that case the words would have been as ill as those of the Roman period, because the words of the Romans were permeated merely by something abstract, who spoke to them words of everlasting life, which appealed not only to their understanding, but also to their feelings, to that which is irrational. Thus we see that we can approach the personality of Jesus of Nazareth, and that we learn to know all the wonderful sides of his character described in the Gospel of St. Luke. But we are also led to all that the Gospel of St. John describes out of inner experience concerning the healer, the therapist, who is also the living Logos, the health-bringing Logos. We learn to connect the synoptic Gospels with the Gospel of St. John. In the same moment when we no longer approach historical research, with the rationalistic idea of what is formally right or wrong, but rather approach historical research with the higher ideas of healthy and ill. Thus the man Jesus loses nothing. For inasmuch as he was chosen to take up within himself the healing impulse of the Christ, he does not require all the wisdom of ancient times, the development of which degenerated into a process of illness so that humanity could no longer recognize the godly element through wisdom, but was only able to recognize, in a pathological way, the exterior, natural aspect of things. We learn to know the One, who, owing to the fact that He was fructified from above, became entirely that being who wandered across the land of Palestine. We learn to consider the personality of Jesus as the outward sheath of the extraterrestrial being of the Christ. And we learn to realize that the earth would have lost its meaning, that it would have perished through illness had the great healing process through the mystery of Golgotha not taken place. Christianity does not lose the irrational, the paradoxical element. Man is only led in the right way toward that which no ratio can understand toward that which can only be understood through a vitalized knowledge such as anthroposophical research strives to bring to man. We see, on the contrary, that precisely the investigation of the life of Jesus has gradually become rationalistic, that the simple man of Nazareth has become the one and only reality for many people, and that they cannot find the Christ again. However, it is not possible to find the Christ through mere logic, even if it is historical logic. The Christ can only be found if we are able to trace the process of history with higher ideas, higher in this connection, such as healthy and ill. Then we indeed come to the point where we realize that the illness that would gradually have befallen man through the awakening of the ego would have led to the death of the spirit, For man would have gradually belonged more and more to nature, 
owing to the extension of the ego, arising out of the body. Nature would have spread over his soul. Man would gradually have fallen a prey to earthly death, and finally to the earth's death through heat. If we realize that the impulse brought by the mystery of Golgotha is one which gives a new meaning to the earth, we then find precisely in historical evolution, through the man, Jesus himself, through the death on the cross and through resurrection, what the earth has received anew from heaven. We learn to know the meaning of the words, quote, This is my well-beloved Son, this day he is born unto me. Close quote. We learn to know that with this moment, a truly new age begins to dawn upon the earth. We learn to know that human beings must gradually educate themselves in order to understand what has entered human evolution through the mystery of Golgotha. And we ask, in what way does this mystery of Golgotha continue to influence mankind? Now, my dear friends, at the time the mystery of Golgotha took place on earth, there was still present something of what, in ancient times, had existed all over the earth, as a matter of fact, namely a certain instinctive knowledge. Man possessed this knowledge, even though the development of the ego had not as yet begun. The human being of ancient times did not possess a clearly defined ego, but on the other hand he had an instinctive knowledge which had been bestowed upon him through an instinctive divine inspiration. This constituted, in ancient times, the healthy element. This was the therapeutic original revelation. But this primordial revelation gradually vanished. The ego began to extend itself over the whole human being, and for this very reason man became more and more ill. Nevertheless, there still existed a few last traces of an ancient, clairvoyant, instinctive knowledge concerning the spiritual worlds. The apostles still possessed such traces of an old clairvoyance. Also the Gnostics and many others possessed it. Although in the case of the Gnostics, these traces were not always perfect or even adequate. Thus it came about that the Christ could still be recognized with the aid of these inherited remnants of a true ancient clairvoyance belonging to the past. People were still able to know that an extraterrestrial being had appeared in Jesus, a being that had never before lived on the earth. It was Paul who experienced this more profoundly than anyone. As Saul, he had already, to a certain extent, been initiated in all the mysteries in which it was possible to be initiated out of the waning light of the ancient wisdom. It was out of this waning light of the ancient wisdom that he had opposed and combated the Christ Jesus. In the very moment, however, that a supersensible vision arose in his inner being, the very moment that Christ appeared before him as the eternally present one, Paul turned toward the cross on Golgotha. The inner experience of the Christ brought him to the outer experience of the Christ. Thus he was able to call himself an apostle, to take his place among the apostles, indeed as the last of their number. Just as the apostles and the disciples were still able to exalt themselves to an experience of the Christ, through the forces which they had inherited from ancient clairvoyant times, in the same way that they were able to understand the resurrection, so also was Paul able to understand it. But with the extension of the ego, this understanding gradually vanished. I might say that theosophy has more and more become theology. Through logic, man gradually abandons his existence as a purely nature being and enters in place of this into the development of his ego which at the same time alternately leads him to that tendency to illness of which we have already spoken. The course of evolution, if it does not wish to lose the understanding of the Christ, must return again to the possibility of recognizing the Christ as a supersensible, superterrestrial being, in order that the personality of Jesus may be valued in the right way. 
Thus we can also understand everything that has taken place since the time of the Apostles, of the Apostolic Fathers. We understand the struggles, the living struggles which took place throughout the centuries, influenced by the waning knowledge of the past and by the gradually developing ego consciousness, those struggles to attain to a vision of the historical Christ. It is not a new religion or a new sect that anthroposophy wishes to found. But if it simply pursues its own path and attains to supersensible knowledge, it must come face to face with the mystery of Golgotha, not merely as one among many other events of earth, but as that event which gives the earth its particular meaning. Anthroposophy teaches us, moreover, that what mere ratio, in parentheses, reason, would cease to understand, can be understood again through supersensible vision. Anthroposophy can again, by following that path of knowledge, which, as we have indicated, is not a rationalistic path, make known the inner divine being of Christ, in addition to the external, historical personality of Jesus. And the concept of Christ Jesus thus acquires again the fullness of content, only that it is a concept which humanity must obtain through freedom. This concept of Christ Jesus may reveal itself, as it were, on the path followed by the poor shepherds, who at first divine inwardly the eternal Christ and then seek him outwardly in the child Jesus. But it is not only, as many would believe, along the path taken by the poor shepherds that we can reach the Christ Jesus. For in that case, science would, in spite of everything, arise like a moloch and swallow up so simple a faith. We can also, if we truly master science, find again that star which leads to Bethlehem. In the same way that the simplest human heart can find the Christ through profound inner experience, if it rises not merely to ratio, but to a feeling of its own inner condition of illness, So this consciousness of being ill, which in its essence is none other than the feeling of a consciousness of sin, may lead in a quite simple and natural way to the experience of the Christ, to a meeting with the Christ. On the other hand, science also cannot lead us away from this experience. For if science attains, as in time it must attain, in all its spheres of learning, to a supersensible vision, then the highest form of science, as well as the simplest feelings of men's hearts, will find the Christ in the man Jesus. This is what anthroposophy would strive in a modest way to achieve. It does not attempt to eliminate the mystery sought in reverent trustfulness by the simple human heart. For the path followed by anthroposophy leads, it is true, to the higher spheres of knowledge, but it does not lead to rationalism. It must be careful to avoid, as I have already explained, the precipices of the irrational and the paradoxical. Indeed, it must substitute for right and wrong the life-filled concepts of healthy and ill. To a mere physical therapy, it must add the great historical therapy. Anthroposophical investigation, if it succeeds in rising to the knowledge to which it strives to rise, will then lead to the same truth which may at first reveal itself to a trusting reverence as the true mystery, that which must remain concealed. Why do we speak of this unknown hidden element? Now, my dear friends, if we know a person not merely through descriptions, if we do not simply believe in his existence, but are led before his countenance, we can then see him. We have a vision of the person. Yet such a vision does not, therefore, have to be rationalistic. The irrational element in the person standing before us does not thereby cease to exist. He remains a mystery to us, for he possesses within him something that is intensively, profoundly infinite. No sort of ratio would be able to exhaust the wealth of his being. In the same way, anthroposophical knowledge cannot possibly exhaust the wealth of Christ. 
even though it may strive with the greatest longing and with all the means of knowledge at its disposal to reach the goal of seeing the Christ, not only of believing in Him. He does not cease to stand before us as a being that cannot be grasped by ratio alone, even when we are able to see Him. And in the same way that a human being does not necessarily lose any of the reverence which we may feel for him, as we feel it for every human being, just because he remains a mystery, even when we are led before his countenance, so the mystery of Golgotha remains a mystery and is not drawn down by anthroposophy into dry abstractions and logical rationalism. Anthroposophy does not in the least strive to eliminate the irrational and the paradoxical in Christianity. Through the Christ Jesus, it reveals to us, it strives rather to see this irrational and paradoxical element. What we are able to see may fill us with just as great a measure of deep and childlike reverence as what we are merely expected to believe, perhaps indeed with an even deeper and even more childlike reverence. For this reason, anthroposophy does not kill faith, but fills it with life. This may be seen especially in the way in which it seeks to unravel the mystery of Golgotha, the union of the Christ with the personality of Jesus. At the same time, all of this, my dear friends, is of course the object of an extensive research carried on over a number of years, indeed a research which has only just begun. And I must ask your pardon if I have pointed out only a few fundamental truths in this lecture, which has already been far too long. Yet perhaps these fundamental lines or thoughts may at least make clear to you that anthroposophy does not in the least strive to draw us down into the rationalism of ordinary knowledge, nor does it wish to make the mystery of Golgotha a mystery that has been irreverently unveiled. It seeks rather to lead us to the mystery of Golgotha with the greatest possible reverence, with the deepest religious feelings, indeed with a deepened religious feeling, which becomes more profound when for the first time we are seized with a feeling of true awe in the presence of the cross on Golgotha. Thus anthroposophy does not wish to contribute toward a deadening of Christianity, but seeks on the contrary to fill it with new life, with a new soul content, for it appears to be suffering painfully under the influence of rationalism, which is fully justified only in the sphere of external natural science. Please consider supporting the creators. Thank you.